There is something about queerness that demands magic and that needs magic. I am mostly drawn to protagonists that are robots, AIs, holograms, ghosts. For me, you can have a whole conversation about Disney. What an awkward situation. I was like, honey, these cheekbones are everything. Morticia Adams probably brought me out of the closet. That's a quintessential coming out story, right? Being gay and being a horror fan, I had to like come out twice in my life. He's out there in his Christmas sweater and he's dropping one-liners like it's a beat. This is the AV Club's Why We Love, an examination into the sometimes subconscious reasons we're drawn to our pop culture obsessions. In this Pride Edition episode, celebrities and thought leaders champion magic, monsters, and everything in between. From the fantastical to the villainous, this was the pop culture from outside traditional narratives that made queer audiences feel seen. This is Why We Love Pride Edition. As a kid was always, I felt drawn to and represented by almost exclusively like non-human characters. Pinocchio was a hero of mine. I think that there was something to the journey of a non-human longing to be real. I dressed up as Pinocchio at least a couple Halloweens and I tell my mom that I wanted to be a real boy. I'm a real boy! I mostly grew up uh, playing role-playing games, RPGs like Final Fantasy, Kingdom Hearts. Just the fact that they're so story-based, you feel like you're, you're a part of the world, contributing to the narrative of it. Sci-fi and fantasy give you the prospect of living in an anthropological environment that is not your own, and thus has rules that can be played with differently. Often, when you're a queer person, uh, there's a lot of world-making that is involved in it, right? Because the, the world that you are put in is not yours, so you have to go off to a city and make your own world there. It's almost like this, like, the safe bubble that you make for yourself. I think that there is something about queerness that demands magic and that needs magic. Because most of the time when we figure out that we don't quite belong, we're young and we're stuck in a structure, a familial structure, a social structure. And there's no way really out of it materially or practically other than through our imagination and other than through the possibility of magic, right? So we're drawn to magic. We're drawn to being able to cast a spell or wave a wand or make an incantation to get us out of this situation that we're in that we feel trapped by. And Harry Potter, of course, the closet metaphor, and I guess Narnia, the wardrobe metaphor, this thing that you have to go through before you get somewhere more sparkly. I, one of my kids was obsessed with a Wizard of Oz as a child. That's a quintessential coming out story, right? Things are bland and gray and you feel kind of bored and then you get somewhere spectacular and wonderful and yeah, maybe it's not all it's cracked up to be, but it's also way more exciting than where you are. Magic really is representative of this possibility of moving outside of the bounds of possibility. You can't tell a queer story without there being some element of magic to it. And I do think that, especially when it comes to video representations of queerness, so much of what's going on is on the inside of us that you really do need elements that allow you to slip back and forth to tell a story that is honest and not boring. I am mostly drawn to protagonists that are robots, uh, AIs, holograms, ghosts. And I think that there's something to feeling like you are not from here, feeling like you are an other, yearning to have what everyone else is born with. Little puppet made of pine, wait. I have an obsession with Disney. Like, I think I love the magic of it all and the fantasy of it all and the, the power to be someone that you're not and to just have this dream and to chase that dream, you know? And I feel like like I wanted to be the princess that got saved by the prince and stuff like that. For me, you can have a whole conversation about Disney because I felt safe in Disney, like so like Beauty and the Beast. The Beast is so different, right? Belle is so different. They're outcasts in their own community, right? Here's this bookish, smart girl who has an opinion. Oh, she doesn't, she doesn't fit in here, right? Ugh, yuck, gross, a woman with thought, get away. And then there's this beast character, right? Who lives in a castle and is isolated and is cursed and is not able to be himself. And is plagued with this whole 
affliction of being beastly, right? Just like, why was I so into Daisy Duck? Because she's like, sort of like forgotten in a corner, right? She's a blank canvas. And I think that's why we were drawn to camp maybe, right? Because it's like weird and off-center and not being for everyone that's, uh, that's appealing to. I don't see how a world that makes such wonderful things could be bad. I think Disney is good at kind of playing both sides of the uh, queer heteronormative divide in that way, right? Because you can identify with Ariel, but you can also identify with Ursula. Ursula is clearly the more interesting character. I thought the villains were the best people. Like, I love Corella in the, the, the live action with a Glenn Close. I was like, now that's a bad bitch. It is rather amusing, isn't it? <laughs> what is? Well, if we make this coat, it would be as if I were wearing your dog. <laughs> I was like, now nah, I need this. I need this ensemble, honey. I need the hair. I need the dramatic. And I was upset with Maleficent. Don't ruin my morning. I was like, honey, these cheekbones are everything. And I think that's probably why I identify with the villains because I felt like they were misunderstood. And because they were misunderstood, they were shut out and put to be by themselves. And that made them angry. That made them, you know, to have some animosity. Why wouldn't it? Well, well. The villains and the weirdos and the outsiders are always uh, a lot more fun. Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, was a massive figure in my childhood. You looking for me? the ultimate extreme like sex pot vampy icon and then like so goofy and like so like kind of like unaware of her inherent appeal like it, it I just like good i love her i was obsessed with the adams family the movies morticia adams specifically angelica houston as morticia adams probably brought me out of the closet like probably <laughs> probably really sealed the deal for me. I thought that she was so hot, like just the way the lighting was always on her eyes, her kind of like coolness and her just matter of fact delivery, the all black, like it, I thought she was perfection as Morticia Adams. Last night you were unhinged. You were like some desperate howling demon. There's a couple things that really got me about it, about Animorphs. One being the yerks, these slugs that go into adults' brains and then just like, it's such good young adult writing. It's that same theme of your inner thoughts being totally different than your outer presentation. Turning into animals kind of changes the way you see the world. And then that was just the like, turning your body into another creature that could do different things. That, it sounds like it has some obvious resonance with like being trans or being gender non-conforming. Like to have a secret ability to escape everyone's attention. <laughs> That's what I wanted. And like the most supernatural and like a uh, teen sphere got me into shows like Buffy. You shouldn't have to touch me when I'm like this. I didn't even notice. Rewatching Buffy now at this like point in my life, when you get to season four, you know, you have Willow getting into a relationship with Tara. I'm like, that's all like powerful. And there's like this really interesting sort of like parallel that's being drawn where like witchcraft is kind of like the stand in for queerness, right? But way earlier than that, you know, Buffy, when she first comes out to her mom, who she's been hiding her slayer identity from for, uh, you know, a while, her mom says, are you sure? Is there any way that you like might not be a vampire slayer? Have you tried not being a vampire slayer? Like, like it starts that early and it's kind of like you can find it in different characters across the span of the series, whether they are queer or not. It's because you didn't have a strong father figure, isn't it? It's just fate, mom. I'm the slayer. Accept it. So I feel like they're all sort of in that intersection of high teen melodrama, which can be construed as metaphor for many of the things that we went through as teenagers. And because they operated in metaphor, it's easier for a gay or queer person to associate with them. I don't know about Ruthie Jean, but he never gonna catch him. Who? Candyman. My introduction to horror 
and I think has really shaped me as a horror fan, but also as a queer horror fan, is the work of Clyde Barker. So I had a double bill of Hellraiser and Candyman as my introduction to horror. And watching a skinless man smoking a cigar like a cigarette after a woman brings him men that he can consume. I mean, hello, it, it's dripping sex, sometimes literally. I think the way that Clive Barker approaches horror is so infused with sexuality and scares and body horror. And then from there, it's like, there's just a bunch of other texts where you start to realize that there's queer coding embedded in otherwise straight texts. The horror genre is so, not as much anymore, but like, I feel like even back in 2014, 2015, like it was like, you know, it's always been the lesser genre. It's the one that's not taken seriously. It's not art, it's trash. And so if you're a film buff, I, still, I feel like if you like horror, you still have to do your own kind of coming out process with that by saying, oh yeah, by the way, I hold horror in high regard. I like it. And people are going to look at you like you're fucked up. So being gay and being a horror fan, I had to like come out twice in my life. I guess I read Firestarter, Cujo, there's one called Christine, one called Misery. Yeah, I got really scared by the by those books. It's like once you've seen it, you just like can't stop looking at it because it was so different, obviously, than anything that was presented to me as a kid. I was interested in madness. I guess really going out of the rules, out of society, like going beyond where no one is allowed to go. Even when you think about Twilight, which takes the vampire and makes the vampire a good guy and a normal guy and a heteronormative guy. I mean, ultimately their lives are kind of stupid and boring, right? Like they're rich, but they're like married and they have a kid. Who cares? Like I'd almost rather be like, the bad vampires. It's always been an element of queer horror to see yourself in the killer, right? Because they're also subversive. If we're talking about films that are taking place in Reagan era conservative environments, this killer is like a return of the repressed. And that's, I think, where a lot of gay people end up situated. Like we're going in there, hacking and slashing away conservative morals. And there's something empowering about that. <laughs> There's a reason that for a lot of queer fans, I'm speculating, but I think a lot of us really enjoy Freddy Krueger. He's out there in his Christmas sweater and he's dropping one-liners like it's a beat. How's this for a wet dream? We're the foreign Eastern Dracula. We're the kind of campy, darker scar. I think we get it. We're much more like Maleficent than we are Sleeping Beauty we're much more like Ursula than we are Ariel. Because who cares about them, right? They are the definition of normal. And we're told over and over again that that's what we're supposed to want to be and that's what's going to get you all the rewards. But I think it, I think the queer, the, the queer in our inner child self knows that that's going to be really horrible for us, right? Their lives just seem so small compared to the bad guys, right? Compared to the queers, the outsiders. Well, in that event, I'd best be on my way. <laughs>